So our next speaker is Karl Marinkovitz, who's an NHR doctoral research fellow from Hull York Medical School, and his talk is on impact of national head injury guidelines and the NHS 24-hour emergency target on mortality and hospital admissions. Carl, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. There are over 1.4 million annual attendances to emergency departments in the UK following head trauma. Around 1% of patients have life-threatening injuries, but it can be difficult to identify who they are. Over the last 18 years, a series of nice and signed guidelines have been introduced in England and Scotland in order to help this assessment and try and improve patient outcomes. These guidelines have all advocated increased CT imaging with the aim of ensuring all serious injuries are identified and to reduce hospital emissions in patients with normal CT scans. The second NICE guideline also specifically recommended that patients with severe injuries are managed in specialist centres. The overall aims of my PhD are to assess whether these guidelines successfully improve patient outcomes and reduce hospital emissions, and develop a prognostic model to help better risk stratify patients with injuries identified on CT imaging. Today I present the results of the first part of this, and this includes analysis of English data which is hot off the press. To look at deaths in England, I estimated the monthly mortality rate from traumatic brain injury using individual level ONS-linked hospital episode statistics. In England, the first NICE guideline was introduced at the same time as the four-hour target. Therefore, I looked at hospital emissions in Scotland where equivalent sign guidelines were introduced at a different time. To do this, I received the monthly aggregated number of patients submitted with ICT-10 codes indicating head injury from Information Service Division Scotland. I converted both of these into monthly rates using ONS mid-year population estimates. I used the quasi-experimental method of interrupted time series analysis to assess the impact of these guidelines. I fitted a time-dependent model using the monthly rates and a discontinuity in either the level or trend at the point at which a health policy is introduced is evidence it may have had a causal effect. So this is the interrupted time series analysis looking at mortality in England in the 16 to 64 age groups. The black dots that you can see are the monthly observed mortality rate, and the curve is a fitted model which goes up and down like this as it incorporates seasonal effects. So we see that the mortality rate is initially increasing, and this is unaffected by either the four-hour target or the first guideline which increases CT imaging. However, when the second guideline is introduced, which advocates the management of patients in specialist centres as well, we see a reversal in trend and a highly statistically significant reduction in mortality rate. Further adjustment for comorbidity and demographic factors did not materially alter the estimates of effect, and this is evidence that only the second NICE guideline acts as to reduce mortality. However, this is only the 16 to 64 age group, and when we looked at those who are aged over 65, we see that the mortality rate increased across the time period and was unaffected by any of the guidelines. Moving on to Scotland, we see that the hospital emissions are initially increasing. The first guideline comes in and increases CT imaging, and hospital emissions start to decrease as patients previously admitted for observation are now discharged following normal scanning. However, when the four-hour target comes in, hospital emissions start to increase again, and this is probably because it's difficult to complete recommended imaging within the four hours. When the second side guideline comes in, this is stricter about imaging being completed soon after arrival, and hospital emissions start to fall again. So this is the first study to use interrupted time series analysis and complete national data sets to assess the impact of the NICE and SIGN guidelines. Poor coding in the administrative data sets I've used wouldn't account for discontinuities at specific time points, and I'm unaware of other potential co-interventions which could have caused what has been observed. Although I've looked at deaths, other outcomes such as disability are important, but they're not routinely recorded. So overall, I found evidence that only the second NICE guideline acted to reduce mortality from brain injury, and then only in the 16 to 64 age group. Guidelines which increased CT imaging alone didn't appear to reduce mortality, but did reduce hospital emissions, which implies they may be cost effective. And the four hour target increased hospital emissions with no observed mortality benefit. My research is now focusing on developing a prognostic model to help identify which patients with injuries on CT may benefit from specialist care, and if any are sufficiently low risk that they may be discharged safely from the emergency department. Thank you. That's great. Questions for Carl? Yes. Uh, the presentation. Can you just comment on the specificity of the ICD coding and how accurate they are? And secondly, because we've taken a very long time period 
could the incident rates of the brain, traumatic brain injury be changing, and therefore could you be admitting low-risk patients, and therefore your death rate is actually lower because of that? Okay, so there's both good questions. So um, the ICD coding um, I've used was defined by the C CDC. Um, it is known that there is poor coding in these administrative data sets, but that wouldn't cause a discontinuity at a specific time point. What that causes is kind of random error, which might make it harder to detect a change. But unless there's a step change in coding, which there isn't, then you wouldn't expect it to cause a discontinuity at a specific time point. So in terms of the effects of the guidelines on hospital admissions, I've looked at um, the mortality rate at the population level, because the guidelines will have affected both admissions and uh, deaths. So it'd be hard to interpret it if you looked at um, the, sort of the deaths per hospital admissions, because they both change at the same time. The ideal thing that you'd look at would be the case fatality in patients who attend the ED, but those data weren't collected um, until about 2007, so it wasn't possible to assess um, the case fatality on patients attending the emergency department with brain injury over that time period. John. The, the abstract didn't cover the death data, so I may have misunderstood it. Apologies if I did. But I was alarmed by an apparent steep increase in death over time. Was that the right impression? And if it is, what's the cause of it? Uh, so the analysis of the mortality data came after I submitted the abstract, but I did check with the organisers and they said I could um, present it today. Yeah. So, that's fine. so in terms of the increase in mortality rate, um, that was in the 65 plus age group. Um, there's been several hypothesized reasons why that might be. So one of them is better case ascertainment. So actually maybe the mortality rate was always quite high, <coughs> but because we weren't scanning these patients, we weren't um, identifying them as a cause of death. But actually, if you look at the trend, it was increasing before the guidelines came in. Um, something else which is happening is that there has been sort of a general increase in falls and in comorbidity in those over 65. Um, and there, there is kind of an um, epidemic of falls, which is disproportionate to population changes of patients, specifically over 85, which might have caused that increase in incidence. Thank you. And any data on anticoagulants? Yeah, so anticoagulation has also increased, um, which could also be contributing to that. Okay, so we've got a question just here, and then David. Thank you, Carl. What about the relationship between time to CT and mortality? Have you looked at that? So, unfortunately, with this kind of administrative data, it's not as rich as something such as time. So what this can tell you is whether or not there's a discontinuity associated with um, individual guidelines. But we can't really drill down into what the components of the guideline are which are working in order to reduce the mortality rate. But it is striking that the only guideline which was associated with any mortality benefit was a guideline which recommended management of patients with severe injuries in specialist centres, and then only in the 16 to 64 age group. So I think maybe just one more question. Obviously, a lot of interest, but maybe just one more question. Hi. Um, thanks for the presentation. So how would you account for practice pattern variation? So the fact that people might adhere to the guidelines differently around the country? Uh, so actually, there's a recent systematic review which looked at um, head injury guidelines, and they found that the NICE guidelines specifically are some of the best adhered to um, in the in the world for any kind of national kind of head injury guideline. Um, and they're pretty kind of black and white, he gets a scan. What's more interesting to me is the kind of the selection of patients who go to specialist centers, um, because that is a much more finite resource. And um, potentially not everyone is benefiting from that. Great, so thanks, thanks very much, Carl. I think we could keep talking about this for a long time, but yeah. <laughs>